40 students had gone home waiting until the quarantine, the things lifted. And um, we were just kind of swung on it. And some will be here at the last minute, too. But uh, I didn't know how many would actually have. But, um, I know they're live streaming it on YouTube. I know of at least a few people who are watching. So. But, um, the Triggs, Mimi Carroll and Papa Chuck. And it, I have no idea. I don't know. My guess is probably no, because she's heard these things before. But I don't know. Yeah. I'll put the link on Facebook to watch this stuff, so we'll see. Thank you. The question is, will you still be applauding at the end? We'll find that out in a few little while, I guess. It's great to be here tonight. Uh, in spite of uh, all the, you know, in the heart of you know, the measles, you know, infestation. Now, I, um, I trust in my immunity on this. I was vaccinated, so uh, we'll, we'll probably make it out alive tonight. It's great to see you here. I know there's been a lot of stuff going on on campus, or maybe not a lot of stuff in another measure, because things are getting canceled. But uh, it's good to be able to speak tonight and do this. And there's some joining us on a live stream. And so if you're live streaming, welcome to you as well. Now we're talking about uh, archaeology. And when we mention archaeology, um, in popular culture, what's one of the first things that comes to mind? Dinosaurs. That's paleontology. But there's a connection. Okay. I saw Indiana Jones. Yes, Indiana Jones. I confess I do have an Indiana Jones hat. All archaeologists have some variation of it because uh, he gets the girl, he looks cool, and who doesn't want that? But uh, in reality, though, he's a horrible archaeologist. What are his tools? His excavating tools, a revolver, a bullwhip, and that's about it. Um, he, uh, he goes into an ancient structure like an old temple where the booby traps are hundreds or thousands of year years old, and they still work. He records none of it, takes no photos. He ignores it all, just ducks, dodges the booby traps, and gets one object, the treasure, you know, the gold or whatever it is, runs out and usually destroys the building in the process, which is not good methodology. <laughs> um, you know, the archaeologists aren't nearly as animated or exciting, and while we do destroy the things we excavate, we do it in a very careful, controlled manner, and we record everything. You have to take buildings apart and dig things up, to go down and see what's under them. So it's a controlled, recorded destruction, but we preserve the information, and we can use that for you know, generations to come. An archaeologist's best friend, 
is this right here, called a trowel. There are some versions of it as a, that are a garden tool, but this is the real thing right here. And this is what you use to uncover those wonderful artifacts. You, use, uh, you don't use shovels, you use hoes and uh, brushes and buckets to haul the dirt away, like the bucket that um, I'm levitating with the force, you know, right there. Uh, but this is the stuff that gets you down close and make, you make your best discoveries with a trowel. And if you want to feel really cool, you get a holster and you can put on your belt and then you can try to feel as cool as Indiana Jones, even though you're not. But um, you can at least delude yourself for a bit. So um, that's a picture from my first year on a dig, which was 10 years ago this past summer, 2009. You see the background, that beautiful setting? That is the Elah Valley where David killed Goliath, somewhere in that valley. So it's a wonderful setting. You get to sit there every day and just look at it, take it in. You don't always dig in a place quite as beautiful and as historic as that, but you usually have historic places pretty much everywhere over in that land. My father went with me uh, that year and several of the years as well, and that's him ready to catch the bucket uh, should the force go out on me. No, I've, uh, I've been a part of 10 archaeological uh, excavation seasons over there, uh, three different sites to date, and um, maybe more. I'm thinking about one next year at another site, and we'll see how that goes. But um, how does archaeology work? Now, we know Indiana Jones is not the right thing. He's not the real deal. It's a fun movie, but there's nothing proper about it. Now, there have been people who are almost a little Indiana Jones-esque, uh, at least there have been, who are very destructive in all the wrong ways. There was the guy about 120 years ago who decided to dig an entire site, and he basically divided the whole site into strips from one side to the other. He'd dig one section up with shovels and dump it in the previous section he dug up. And so basically he turned the entire thing upside down and about 10 meters over. And so um, it's the way not to do things. Uh, jumbled up, everything's a mess, uh, no context, and so he really didn't get nearly what he could have from it. And he left the entire site messed up for future generations. They talk there about that. They, they've done other work at that site and been able to make some sense. They talk about like, you know, a, a Bronze Age layer and an Iron Age layer. And the, his name was McAllister, the McAllister layer, which is everything just like a, a messed up puzzle. So, uh, and there's the guy about 200 years ago who discovered ancient Troy. You know, the Iliad, Hector and Achilles. But his excavation methods included dynamite to blow up stuff that was in his way, like ancient walls and buildings, which is not good methodology either. Thankfully, we've moved on beyond that, and we're much more careful. Now, how does it really work, though? You don't use dynamite. You don't use shovels. They're too imprecise. Um, what, how do you go about doing things? And here's a short version for tonight. Uh, first of all, you have to select a place to dig, right? And this is a biblical city called Lachish or Lachish, however you want to pronounce it, one of the places I've dug uh, so far. But you select a site, and usually it's a place that's uh, kind of a mound, a flattish top. People have lived there before. You can tell it's been shaped by ancient cities that may or may no longer, you know, there may be nothing there anymore. There may be a modern city on top of it. Um, you have to choose a place, and there are hundreds of places to choose from in the Bible lands. Actually, if you go beyond Israel and uh, thousands of places if you go to like you know Greece and Egypt and all those things too and then once you choose a place you get your hat and your shovel no um, you get your hat but uh, you have to choose what questions to ask or what you want to answer for example uh, it, ma it makes a difference in how you dig is this a place that no one's ever been there before no one's ever dug before who lived here when was it occupied you know, how many different civilizations might we encounter when we go down? If you don't know anything about it, you might just start digging in a few places and just go down as far as you can, like cutting a slice out of a layer cake. And so you can count the layers and see what color they are, you know, what, what's in them, what time period they date to, and get a sense of what happened there, because you have no idea. But if someone's dug there before, like this site, you may have more specific questions. Maybe you're looking for one specific period, like maybe what we call popularly the judges period, or maybe the Roman period, or you know, pick one. And you go to an area where you think you're going to find that particular period, and you try to find those things. When you find the period you're looking for, you stop once you've gone to the bottom. You don't keep going down because you're limited with your questions, or more specific with your questions. 
Um, there are all sorts of things you can look for. You know, when did some event happen that's related to this that area or that city? Uh, what were the people like? How did they worship? What did they worship? Who did they worship? How were they destroyed? Where did they come from? Uh, there are all sorts of answers to those questions, and it depends on where you are. Figure out what you're looking to answer. Uh, otherwise, what are, you, what are you looking for? You just dig and have no, just, you know, you have, you, these days you really have to have a focus. Specific questions you're seeking to answer. And when you answer them, whether it takes one year or ten years or twenty years, then you wrap it up and you move on to somewhere else. And some digs last just, you know, a very short time, a two or three years. Others go on for more than 20 years because they're still trying to answer their original questions. Or new ones pop up and they can answer them. So uh, you have all that. And another question, once you've chosen a site, where on the site do you actually dig? This is a photo, you see that on, the, on the left, an area that looks like it's been dug and worked a lot. It's a city called Hazor, or Hot Sore, as they call it over there, a biblical city up north of the Sea of Galilee. And um, where do you dig? Well, you see the areas where they dug, but let's change, let's add something to this photo. See, see how big the city really is. The area on the left where they've worked, that's just the upper part of the city. Those fields on the, the lower city, it's huge and vast. It's like 200 acres. By contrast, Florida College's campus on this side of the river, 22 acres. So it's, what, nine times bigger than Florida College's campus. And when you where do you dig? <laughs> the guy who first dug here described it as performing acupuncture on an elephant. I mean, what do you do? And here's how we dig. When we dig, we don't just start tearing into fields and going, you know, all the way down. Modern archaeology divides it into squares, typically a square. So you can focus. It's like a snapshot of the site. And here is a site, a different one, but you see the different squares marked with white sandbags. Each one of those has a group of maybe five people working it. This is about three seasons worth of work here. So it's been months of work. Uh, each season's a few weeks, a year. So this is months of work, and this is a small site, this one right here, but look at how much of it is still untouched after months of work. So it's, you have these little squares, and you work within those squares, and if you find something really interesting that goes off into the side, maybe they'll open another square and see what's on the other side so you get a better picture. It's very flexible. If nothing's turning up here, you can just open a square in a more interesting area. It's focused, it's logical, it keeps things organized. And one rule for archaeology is that you don't just dig the whole site up. You leave something for the future. You know, in 50 years, someone may have better methods, better technology. They can learn things, more things than we can, maybe without having to be as destructive. Leave something for them so they can find better answers than we're able to find right now. The guy who used dynamite on the city of Troy, he took away a lot of what we could have gotten from it. You know, thanks, bud. You know, not. But um, it, where we've learned a lot through our mistakes. And um, so how does it work? You see, so we've gone through select a site. Yeah, we did that. Decide where to dig on the site. We've done that. Then you dig. And as I mentioned, you divide it up into squares. Here's one I took this past summer. Um, you can see how the, the squares are. And you divide it up about five meters by five meters, but sometimes smaller than that. And this is everyone getting an orientation. And after this, people divide up into teams and go into the squares and excavate very slowly with uh, scraping the dirt, keeping it level. You drain a square. You take the dirt out like a bathtub drains. You keep it even. So when you find something, you know what level it is. Because these things, these sites were built over thousands of years. You build a city 4,000 years ago. It's destroyed. You come in and you level everything off, build on top. It's destroyed after a while. You level everything off, build on top. After centuries and millennia of that, you stack up this artificial hill made of burned out, destroyed cities. And uh, the closer to the top you get, the more recent you get. You dig down and you go down. Each level is older than the one before it. And so it's easy to mix levels up. So you go evenly down uh, and uh, so you know where you are all the time and how things might relate. And you can see some of a wall right there in the bottom square. That's the way archaeology is done today, and it's, uh, it's very methodical and careful, and we find a lot more than we used to, because this way you find all the small things. The small things usually tell you more than the big things. So it's, uh, 
very useful. But after you dig, that's not the end, at least for the archaeologists. For the volunteers, like you or me, this is usually the end of it, but others who are professionals, who this is their career, they research. What does Indiana Jones say in the third movie? You know, most archaeology is done in the library. Research. You, you look into what you found and figure out what it means. So you found a few weapons. How old are they? Are, there other we are they similar to weapons somewhere else? Can you tell where they came from? Uh, and uh, around it are the weapons. Was it, did they land there where you dug because of a battle? Was it a storehouse? Does, uh, does someone just collect weapons, you know, in their basement or something? Now figure out those things. When you think you have it researched and figured out, the big thing you publish. You put it out there, all the photos, all your notes, all your conclusions, and let everyone check it out. And there are some people who might look at it and find answers you didn't or better answers than you did. And that's the way it works. Total transparency, you put it out there so everyone can see what you found and help you figure out what it means for us. That's archeology span in a nutshell. But there, um, there's some exciting stuff too, right? Um, one question I get asked a lot is, will you find something? How do you know how old it is? And the simplest answer is pottery. Ancient pottery, they were like our Tupperware, our pantry, your, your dresser drawers, um, your freezer, your fridge, um, your garage, your toolbox. All that was pottery back then. So it's everywhere. And pottery is like fashion. You look at it, look at the style, and it'll usually tell you wh what time period it's from. Let me, let me test you here. For example, on fashion. Tell me what decade this is. Bell bottoms, big collars, afro hair. 1970s, maybe the late 60s, but really the 1970s. Okay, try this one. Uh, parachute pants. Oh, I already see. 1980s, right? Yeah, okay. You see, we can date people by fashion. I describe a few fashion characteristics. You know the decade, or a lot of us do. So that pottery is the same way. Pottery has fashion. And pottery from the time of Jesus has a different fashion than pottery from the time of David and then the time of Abraham. And people who are trained in this can look at the pottery you're digging up and put it within a time period automatically, usually a couple centuries or so. But that's not bad just, you know, for a few seconds looking at something. You can refine it later and get closer. But uh, pottery is a great way to date things. It's fashion. If you're um, after about 400 B.C., like on our side of 400 B.C., coins. And uh, what do our coins today show besides the picture of a person? A date, the year it was made. Ancient coins, uh, they have a picture of the current ruler. And so if we know when Nero ruled, and we do, and we find coins of this picture, this coin dates to Nero's reign, 60s A.D. And so uh, coins are a great way to date things too. And they compare it to pottery and they can kind of calibrate each other. You also have the strata, the different layers of a site. And uh, it builds up over time. The, the ones on top kind of came later than the ones underneath. And so that helps you kind of put things in perspective. And suppose you find the same pottery on the third level down on this site as some other site's seventh level. If you have the same pottery in the third level here and the seventh here, it means the third level here and the seventh level here were inhabited at the same time. Because not, not every site has the same, you know, local history. And so that kind of helps you calibrate things too. And gives you a fixed point to help put things in order and get a better sense of the date. Sometimes, you know, written history tells us about events or something that happened. And we can see evidence of an event and that helps us date it too. Architecture has style, fashion as well. Certain styles are fashionable in different time periods. And scientific testing. Carbon-14. Uh, residue analysis of pot of inside of pots. You can tell what it used to have, uh, what was used to be in that pot. You can do mineralogical tests and find out when certain stones were worked, how long ago something was done to it, and all sorts of neat things like that that can help us. All these things together zero in and give us tell us how old things are. Let's try a quick test with some artifacts. Uh, give me an approximate date for this artifact. 1940, that's 44, that's remarkably specific. The 1940s, you know, World War II, Army Jeep, 1940s is a pretty safe bet. 
They used them afterwards, of course, and uh, had them in the late 30s, too, the 30s, but uh, that's actually a 1942 right there. But if you just know decades, you've got just a couple seconds, and you can, get a, you can stamp that to a, within a few years. How about this artifact? Give me a, an approximate decade. The 20s? 1920s. Good. Okay, anyone else want to take a shot at it? Okay, it's a little bit earlier. It's actually 1908. But you know what? 1920 is pretty close. And if you investigate it some more, I'm sure you could zero it in some more. How about this one? It's a Ford Mustang. I'll give you that one. What year? What decade? 60s. Specifically, it's a 1967 because you, there are certain details unique to 67. But if you don't know that, you can still put it in the 60s, which is really good. How about this Mustang? Decade. The 2000s? That's right, it's 2007, so it's in the 2000s. First decade of the 2000s. You see, you're not doing too bad. You could be archaeologists. Yeah. Now, there are some things to watch out for. Beware certain archaeological subjects and sources. What do I mean by that? You ever heard archaeological announcements that sound too good to be true? If they sound too good to be true, they probably are. Have you ever encountered anything on television about, say, the Ark of the Covenant being in Ethiopia after it went to Scotland, for example? I'm serious. Or the aliens built the pyramids, you know, we do things like that. Beware TV archaeology and video archaeology. Some of it's just nuts. Some of it's really out there. You, know, you see programs like this, you know, Mysteries of the Bible, Secrets of the Bible. Who makes these? Archaeologists? TV people. What's their interest? Let's find the academic truth. Yeah. What, are they, what do they want? Why are they making it? To get ratings. Make something people want to see. Don't trust them. And if it sounds outlandish or incredible, especially don't trust it. Some video series are better than others, but um, if a video series is not made by a trained archaeologist, at least be careful, you know, because uh, archaeology is easy to get wrong. Beware social media archaeology. You ever see anything on social media that may not be true? Yeah. And here, the famous one is like the chariot wheels beneath the Red Sea. That one comes up every few years, and it sounds legitimate. Um, you know, people have found chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea, and that links to the Exodus, and therefore, you know, the Bible's right again. Well, I'll tell you, that area has been inhabited and sailed continuously for thousands and thousands of years. How do we know those particular circles are the very chariot wheels of Pharaoh's army from the time of Moses? Could it be from some other time period, some other thing? Of course. Uh, don't trust it. And those are not, in fact, are not chariot wheels on the bottom of the Red Sea. One thing they've never done, the people who announced this, is bring one of them up and let us analyze it and then be transparent and let everyone see it. They keep them down there. They just take pictures and tell you what to think. No one tests it. No, there's no transparency. They don't tell you how they were able to eliminate all the other centuries and thousands of years of human habitation around that area that could explain something like that. So it sounds really good, but we can't believe it. And watch out for what some people, I wish I'd come up with this, ark eology, as in Noah's Ark. Every, every so about once a decade, plus or minus, sometimes more, sometimes less, someone announces they found Noah's Ark. And it's always in a different place. Sometimes it's outright fraud. People know they're lying and they're just trying to get money. Sometimes people are very sincere and believe they have found it. One thing no one has ever done is given us something to analyze. It's never happened. No transparency. No way to share it and let other people check the conclusions. And you have to have that. If you're claiming, and this is one of the places, someone's claimed that it's approximately the dimensions of the ark and it's petrified and it preserves the ark landed right here. First of all, people have been there and checked it out. It's a natural rock formation. So uh, it's not, and look at the right side. See how it bulges? And it's just, you know, small things that you know, don't seem like that big a deal are a big deal. You wouldn't build a boat like that. Why would it bulge like that? Um, but we have to watch out because um, even sincere people, if you're going to make a big claim, you have to have big evidence to back it up. Otherwise, no big evidence, we can't accept the claim. 
we need to have evidence. And what happens if we believe it without big evidence? If we, because we trust them and they seem sincere, we risk looking foolish in the eyes of the world, believers in the Bible. Because we have a reputation uh, for being gullible. That's what a lot of scientifically minded people who are not believers accuse us of. You're gullible. You believe anything just because you want to believe it. And sometimes that happens. That there's, some, there's a history that's led to that. Believing, accepting this without challenge is part of the problem. If we're going to make big claims, we need big evidence. Otherwise, we cannot accept the claim. And what's, what's wrong with that? Nothing is. So beware archaeology. It's a, it's a thing. But let's get into some real stuff. And here's something I've been involved in. I'll give you a summary of some of the work I've explored. It connects with David, King David. Because there's something called, uh, I just call it the David problem. What's the problem with David? Well, the big, the, in short, the Bible describes him as having a kingdom and an organized army and a government, and yet archaeology for many, many years excavated and excavated, and there's nothing, there's no evidence to support that. We find evidence that, that support kingdoms from other periods and other places. It, you know, kingdoms tend to build things. Uh, the pyramids, was that built by a strong king or by a local shepherd in his time off? The pyramids. How about the Colosseum in Rome? Did uh, a few local farmers do that you know, on weekends or was that a big government who, that could afford to set up architectural schools and control huge amounts of money and control large numbers of workers to put something like that together? It's evidence of organization, education, government. And there's no evidence of any of that. There wasn't for a long time in the time period of David in, in Judah where he lived. It's a problem. The Bible, the Bible itself describes the culture David came from as tribal and not really centrally organized. Here's what it means. Um, the Canaanites, when Israel came in, the Bible describes them as living in cities. Did the, did the Canaanite kings have governments? I said kings, didn't I? I gave it away. Did the cities have governments? They had kings. A king is a leader. He has people working under him, a bureaucracy, taxes, engineers and architects, um, people to keep records and send messages and archives and all those boring sounding things which actually are necessary but uh see tribal societies like israel they're agricultural they live in the countryside they don't really cities aren't really a big deal for a tribal society cities aren't that important uh you don't have huge populations in the cities and most people live out in the country on their farm or their vineyard or their olive grove or they're pasturing their sheep and goats and so um you know when you're out when everyone's a farmer or a shepherd, you don't have bureaucrats with a huge government. You don't have a lot of record keeping. You don't have people building coliseums or even big cities. And the Bible um, actually backs this up, as well as archaeology. Even in the world today, we go to areas that are very tribal. Let's throw Afghanistan. Um, a lot of Afghanistan is tribal to this day. Cities in many areas are smaller, fewer, not as important as they would be in a place like the United States, for example. And um, there aren't, in those rural tribal areas, there's not a lot of big stuff being built. Small things, homes, you know, uh, mosques, uh, things like those you know, low walls just to keep the animals in or maybe provide a, a rudimentary defense against enemies if you're attacked, things like that. Uh, no central planning, you don't have central architects. But kingdoms or cities, urban societies, you have opposite of all these things. Cities are big centers of wealth and power and uh, government. You have a government. You have bureaucrats and agencies that take care of this and that in the name of the leader, the king, the president, whoever. You keep records. You tax people. You keep records of their taxes and uh, all that fun stuff. And you plan things. You have guys who go out and build defenses the same ways in all your cities. You have your roads made to a certain standard. You may maybe crank out weapons, you know, with a, some uh, regular molds, and you mass produce weapons, and you make deals and trade deals, uh, uh, agreements, defense treaties. Uh, the government has power over people, and all these things. And the Bible describes Israel and the Canaanites they were conquering in these very kinds of ways, even just simple things. Look at this phrase. After the conquest, 
Canaanite societies. The Canaanites who were left in the land, they were urbanized. Look at this description. It's talking about the territory given to each tribe. One area that's still inhabited by Canaanites is a, uh, what would be later is a Philistine city called Ekron. Ekron. And in Joshua 15, it describes Ekron as having, there's Ekron, a city, and it has its towns, the suburbs, and it has its villages, little farming communities. So what's the center of that area? The city of Ekron. And then you have your towns, then you have your farming villages. And so you see the order of Canaanite society, their chief city where the king lives, and then their smaller towns, and then their um, agricultural settlements. You go to the tribes, though, and look at the difference. Instead of a city with its towns and villages, you have a tribe with clans, their family units, and their towns and villages. What's the center of that? It's the clan, or the tribe, or the family unit. That's the center of that society, the Hebrew society. And then you have the towns and farming communities. With the Canaanites, it's a big city with a government. With the tribes, it's the family units, a council of tribal elders. You see the difference? And that's what David came out of. When David was born and was growing up, it was still a tribal society. For the Israelites, cities were not a big deal yet. Most people were still tribal. And so we go to the kingdom of Saul, and we're beginning a transition, but we look, and look at Saul. Is he like really an urbanized king, or is he king over a bunch of tribal people? The stories of Saul consist almost entirely of his military actions. You know, no, we don't have him planning towns or building things. He did, there's no record of him building anything in the Bible. Um, just just uh, leading soldiers out into battle. Um, how authoritative was his power? How much power did he really have? We know that he had trouble keeping armies in the field sometimes. And we have no stories of him among the northern tribes up in Galilee. Is it because those just aren't preserved and maybe he did things but were not recorded? Maybe. It also could mean that his power was really more down in the southern area where he lived. He really didn't have over his reign that much authority or power in the north. And so it was the further away you are, the looser, you're, the looser you are in terms of control. It's possible. As mentioned, you know, the soldiers in danger, they tend to melt away and he can't, he doesn't have the authority to keep them there. Not really. It's still a tribal society. And uh, he's a king, but he's a king over tribes. And David inherits this, a tribal society. Let me ask this question. When we're getting, when we're looking for David in archaeology, what do we want to find? David's kingdom, what do we expect to find? A kingdom. Palace, you know, big cities, evidence of a kingdom, you know, uh, power, and, you know, government, and things like that. David's authority extending far and wide. Saul's authority clearly did not appear to extend far and wide. There's nothing in the text that suggests that. In fact, quite the opposite. But David, he's a great king. His authority extends far and wide. We should find an urban guy here, right? But there's a problem. We go to David, and um, he's a strong king. The Bible des describes his military, very effective. He builds a few things in Jerusalem. But outside of Jerusalem, the Bible doesn't describe anything. He builds a palace. In fact, he has to import workers from Phoenicia up north to come build his palace for him. Israel doesn't have the know-how yet to build large structures, apparently. Building a large, you know, multi-level palace... Israel doesn't have architects or engineers who know how to do that yet. You have to get trained up. So he imports his workers from Phoenicia in uh, 2 Samuel 5. Um, little details like that indicate it's still a tribal society. Um, it still is. And look at verses like this. When he becomes king, who does he have to deal with? Who does he negotiate with or, or deal with to uh, get the kingship? In 1 Samuel 5, um, actually it should be 2 Samuel 5, I believe, We'll give the computer virus. It says, when David's down in, uh, in Hebron or Hebron, king over his tribe of Judah, all the tribes, the you know, tribes are still a thing, their elders come to David. He makes a, a covenant, an agreement with the elders of the tribes. You have to deal with the elders. You don't have governors or rulers or generals. There's a general, but he, he still has to deal with the elders of the tribes. You're dealing with the family units. He has to negotiate with the elders of the tribes to work out an agreement for him to be king over everybody. It mentions it again um, uh, in chapter 3. Abner, Saul's general, he conferred with the elders 
and says, look, you've wanted David as king, let's make it happen. He has to t you talk to the family units through the elders. It's a tribal unit still. But now you go to Solomon. Solomon changes things. He built the temple. He built a lot of stuff. We see he's engaging in diplomacy, massive construction, international policies with trade and other things. And David, on a much bigger scale than David ever did in the text. And we see that it's becoming no longer a tribal society. The family unit is changing. And we know it from this verse right here. 1 Kings chapter 4, this whole section. 1 Kings 4 describes Solomon. He reorganizes society. See, he's a big government guy. Look what he does. It says Solomon had 12 officers over all of Israel, 12 guys over a whole country, who provided food, you know, taxes for the king and his household. Each of the 12 men had to make was responsible for one month of the year. And then uh, there is one governor over the whole land. So what is this? Where, what happened to the elders? They've been replaced by local governors who are under one governor who reports to Solomon. He just replaced the tribes with a kingdom, with a, with a real effective, long-reaching government. And that's maybe one reason why people resented him later on and wanted to break away. He was changing the culture they grew up in. And he made it more powerful, but he, he extended his authority and replaced the tribal elders' authority with his own and his political appointees. You know, and that, that's wisdom for an effective government, but, you know, when, if big government extends into areas and starts having bureaucrats run your life, people often tend to resent that. And we, we probably get that. And, um, but we see a change. In David's time, it's still a tribal society. Solomon's really the one in the Bible who changes that. So let's go back. We're looking. I mean, and we see this also, this, uh, an indication. The Bible lists like the, the, the cabinet, the presidential cabinet for each king. With Saul in 2 Samuel, it mentions the commander of his army and the guy over his flocks, an Edomite. They're not, not a big cabinet. David, it lists several people. It has a secretary and a recorder. They're finally keeping records in David's time officially. Someone over the forced labor. You know, part of your taxes is your work. You take, you know, a certain time of year, you go work on the king's construction projects. Part of your taxes. There's someone over that. Not in Saul's time, apparently, and that we know of, but David introduces that. And Solomon, look at the list of people. It's longer. The government's growing. And so let's go back to the David problem. We're looking for the kingdom of David. What do we expect to find? And we say, well, a kingdom, evidence, but David was king over a tribes. Are they building lots of stuff yet? No. Not in the text, anyway. The building and the real transformation comes after David. So if we're looking for a kingdom, archaeology hasn't found it much in David's time, though we've made some progress, though. But if the archaeology and the Bible don't seem to match, what do we do with that? Well, the Bible describes David with all these things there. Um, we think uh, big buildings and fortified cities, it really actually it should be Solomon's time, but um, you know, we can't find evidence of the, of the things we tend to look for in David's time. Uh, but what we go is that uh, the three possibilities. Whenever archaeology doesn't seem to match the text, let's go ahead and throw it out there. Why don't they agree? Possibly the Bible is wrong. I'm philosophically opposed to that one. <laughs> I believe there's usually a better answer than that. Maybe always a better answer. Um, but some people insist on that and that the Bible has stories that were just made up or they were changed and edited from the original version. And, you know, that's why there's a disconnect sometimes in what we dig up in the ground and what the Bible actually says. And like, like David, there's a kingdom, but where is the kingdom? And so some people conclude, well, David didn't have a kingdom. If he existed at all, he was probably just some local guy. And later on, people changed his story when they wrote the Bible. And there are people who believe that. And who have announced that. And so how do we deal with that? Is the Bible wrong? Another possibility. Maybe the archaeology is wrong. Maybe we're digging in the wrong place. Or maybe what we're looking for didn't survive to be found. People recycled back then. Not with the green bins. But if you're building your house and you come across the ruins of a building. Well, I don't know what this was, but look at those wonderful stones. I'll just take these stones and use them to make my house. And you just take all the stones and the evidence of this thing and take them somewhere else, and they're gone. They're not there to be found anymore. That's possible. And sometimes people 
just don't dig in the right place. They miss things and uh, form the wrong conclusions as a result. Or maybe another possibility is that we are wrong. Sometimes we read things, we read things into the text that are not really there. Like David's kingdom. Obviously we're going to find evidence of a big government everywhere. And if you look at the details, it's a tribal society. He didn't go building big things in the text. Maybe we're looking for the wrong thing. We're assuming something that's not there. And so we interpret the archaeology incorrectly or we interpret the Bible incorrectly. Or maybe both. I think that when there's a disconnect, it's either two or three, in my experience. And sometimes we just don't know the answer. Maybe we'll find something in a few years which will change the way we understand it. We have to have faith. We can't be dogmatic. The Bible's wrong because there are plenty of times where the Bible has been declared wrong and then we dig something up that says, actually, it wasn't that wrong. Actually, after all, it was actually correct. And here's an example of that with David. No evidence of David. For years, we had no one even mention his name. We couldn't find his name mentioned in any inscriptions. We found a lot of biblical kings in inscriptions from Egypt or Assyria or Babylon or other places, uh, but we never found David's name. He's supposed to be a great king. Well, in 1993-94, people found a tablet made by Syrians, not by Israelites, by people from Syria that mentions, see the white letters, they've been highlighted so we can recognize them, reading right to left, Bet David, which is the house of David, the dynasty of David. The Syrians, this is about 100, 150 years after David, about a century, century and a half after David, the Syrians are talking about the descendant of David who was ruling in the, in the, down in Judah. They recognize there's a dynasty that David founded, and they call it the, the family of David, the dynasty of David, the house of David. The Syrians recognized it not long after David's lifetime. And so David's mentioned relatively close to his lifetime, and his descendants, his legacy is alive. And other people are talking about it besides Israel. The place I worked first is this city, the one over David and Goliath's battlefield in that area called Kirbet Kayafa. It's not, that name's not biblical, but what's special about this city is that it's the first one we've ever found that was built in the time of David. There were cities that were built way before David's time that were still around, but they weren't built in David's time. There are other cities built after David's time. There's a period where very little new was built in Canaan because it was just an economic depression and society collapsed and it's a tribal society. What are you going to build if you're a bunch of tribes? But this city was built around David's time and it's a planned city, and it's on the border uh, of Judah and the Philistines. The Philistines were around, and that's easy to demonstrate. They had big cities, powerful cities, organized government, they organized the military, so they can go and, and push you or punch you if they don't like what you're doing. The Bible describes it, and we see it in the archaeology too. The Philistines were powerful, yet someone built a city right on the border with them, and the Philistines couldn't stop it. It's a fortified city, which should be a problem for the Philistines. It means it has big, thick walls that can protect you, protect the inhabitants against an attack. And here's an example. You see the walls here? It's not a solid wall. It's a, a wall out here that is spaced between that another inner wall, and then you have the smaller buildings. It's cheaper and it's faster to build than a solid wall. If you don't have a lot of resources or a lot of time, your tribes don't have a lot of resources yet. You're trying to get your government together. You don't have tons of resources. This is a cheaper, faster wall to build. If the enemy attacks it, you fill up the spaces in between with dirt and rocks and turn it into an Oreo cookie wall, a temporary solid wall. If you survive the attack, you can clean out the dirt and rocks and you have your space back again. And uh, what's interesting about these is that the, these spaces in the walls were part of people's homes. And so you can get your, you know, your den back or your kid's bedroom or whatever it is, your storage room. Uh, the gate, there are two gates to the city, and they have the very same design. It means there's an architect building them the very same way, down to where the sewer line is running out underground. They're the, the same dimensions, the same size, the same shape, the same features. There's someone building these things in a planned way. That's not something local shepherds are capable of doing. That's something where you're beginning to get a professional architectural school together and someone's able, learning how to do these kinds of things. I mentioned that 
the houses are actually connected to the city wall. And that's kind of a unique feature because there's no, there's no street or alleyway to separate the city walls from the private houses. You have your public property and your private property mixed, which is an interesting thing. And you only find that in certain areas. See here, here's an aerial view. You see the sandbags? They, they made squares and opened everything up once they were done. But see, there's the outer wall and an inner wall, and there's a doorway always in the same place, and there are the thinner walls of the homes connected, and each home has access to one of those areas. It's a design. It's a plan. Someone's designing a city with features, and they're building it in the time of David, and it's similar in design to, to at least three other cities that we found in or around Judah. Slightly later, but this is the earliest example. But these cities, you might recognize Beersheba, biblical city. That one might be one called Mizpah, but as someone suggested, it's another city, and I'm blanking on that right now. Anyway, they have the very same design, the same kind of wall with houses attached. You don't find this in Israel. You don't find this with the Philistines or the Canaanites in this time period. It's unique to Judah. But didn't David rule over Judah first? And wasn't government in the Bible formed in Judah first? And the north caught up later. You develop a different style, architecturally. You also have a central fortress, those walls that are noted by the arrows, three feet thick. And on the corner over there was a tower at least two or three levels high. So that's a structurally a big thing to figure out. We have an inscription. We have, it's, a lot of it's faded. We can't translate all of it. But we have writing. People are writing messages down. And it might be the oldest Hebrew inscription ever discovered. We're still debating that. But um, they also found a jar with someone's name on it. These are the taxes from this guy's farm or his olive grove. So people are keeping records of things. They can write messages back and forth. And it's not just a, tri just a tri illiterate tribal society. It's a society that's increasingly able to build bigger things. And so uh, this is, I worked five years at this site helping to dig it up with some other people, a lot of other people. And so um, who lived there? Well, some people say maybe it was Philistines or maybe a Canaanite city, you know, not Judah, because Judah was not a city-dwelling folk yet, not really. And yet, the architecture matches other cities in Judah. We have um, the cooking habits. We have uh, a bunch of animal bones we found, but none of the bones we found, thousands of bones, not one pig bone. Pigs are not lawful for Jews, for Israelites. And we didn't find any there. You go to Philistine sites or Canaanite sites, you find some pork. They had pepperoni on their pizza. You know, if you're an Israelite, you don't do pepperoni on your pizza. You do, you know, lamb or something. But um, also have baking trays, uh, making pita bread. That's one where we found at our site. Philistines didn't use those kinds of trays to make that kind of bread. So it's a distinct thing. Storage jars, the design is similar to later ones from the, the kingdom of Judah. There's like a, a connection, a history there where they're similar in uh, developing. And the inscription looks to be Hebrew, but it's definitely not Philistine. The Philistine language was as different from Hebrew as Russian is from English. You know, it's a very, very different, a different family of languages. And um, we had evidence of a worship practice that connected more with Judah and uh, the scriptures than the pagans around them. Uh, so it's, it appears that it's evidence of Judah. And what we have from all this is, for the first time, evidence of David's kingdom, perhaps. It's in the area of David's kingdom, the time of David's kingdom. Uh, we see central authority, a growing central authority, that's, for the first time, able to start building cities with the same design and planning. And uh, they're growing in their skills. Um, they're able to go to the border, build a, a fort, a fortified city, and say, this is our boundary. Philistines, stay out. And they're able to keep the Philistines out while they build it, which shows some power, some authority to manage people and resources, to hold off the Philistines, who are quite powerful. So that's evidence of a powerful king with a powerful military who built this thing right there on the border. And it sat there for a few decades at least, it seems. Evidence of writing... You have literacy, they're able to write laws, keep records, write psalms, and things like that, and that's important. Uh, administration, record keeping, governments, you have bureaucrats. I mean, we, we don't like that, but it's a fact. Not as exciting as Indiana Jones. You know, bureaucrats, hooray. But, no, but it's, it's important, because you need that if you have a government. You don't have bureaucrats, you don't have a strong government. That's just the long and short of it. 
And we have evidence of people beginning to keep records of things. And so evidence that Judah has these, bit, these things that point to a kingdom in David's time. And this is all within the past decade, really, that we've been able to really do all this. It's a very new thing. And so um, that's, uh, that's what I've been involved with for a lot uh, of time. Um, a few last things, and we'll have a, just a little bit of question and answer, hopefully. Archaeology in general, though, this is one place, and you're, you, everything's been published, or about to be published, finished being published. This site, full transparency, everything we found is out there, published. People can look at it and say, I agree, or I think you made the wrong conclusion. And people are doing both. <laughs> so but that's the way it works. Full transparency, people can analyze it, and that's for the better of everyone. You, you can accept things like this because we have something to show and something people can compare and analyze themselves and see, fact check us. We're not perfect. And finally, let's, let's conclude with a few things. How can archaeology benefit us? Quick question. How long is a cubit? Which kind of cubit? Give me one of the kinds of cubits. What, what, what do we usually think of? Think of a cubit, what do you learn in Bible class or whatever? How long is a cubit basically? 18 inches about the length from you know, here to the elbow, right? How do we know that? Archaeology. We found official cubit measures. Oh, we found two different types. So, um, how much was a denarius worth? About a day's pay in the time of Jesus. How do we know that? Archaeology. What was crucifixion like? We have a little bit on archaeology to illuminate that. But um, archaeology has some benefits for us. And sometimes we don't realize the things that we just carry around because someone figured it out first by digging things up. One thing archaeology does, though, here's a, here are a few things to throw in there. It gives a context for Bible events. Uh, here's an example. We're not going to read it for lack of time, but for due to time. But Abraham, in Genesis 14, Lot was captured and taken into captivity. The Bible says Abraham organized 318 men and pursued them, fought a battle at night, and brought everyone back home safely. Now, could an old shepherd do that? Now, that's pretty impressive. Um, well, there's an artifact that gives us some illumination. How did Abraham pull off a complex military operation? This is a thing in the British Museum called the Standard of Ur. You can see a person there, just to give, it's not a big thing. It's a box made out of wood, and it's from what may have been Abraham's hometown. There are two theories on that. This is one of them. But this is a, a couple centuries before Abraham, basically. But you see on there depictions of soldiers. And they have uniforms. They're all dressed the same way with these helmets and these cloaks with, with dots on them. And weapons are the same. Back then, armies, all the, all the young men served in the army as part of your obligation to the government, part of your taxes. Did Abraham possibly serve in the army when he was younger? We don't encounter him until he's 75 years old. Abraham probably had military experience. And so it gives us insight into him and how he pulled something like that off. Yes, he was blessed by God, which is a big thing, but he had something real and practical to draw on. How did you convince 318 men to follow you? If you're an old guy with a cane who keeps sheep, who's going to trust their lives to you? He probably had military experience, and this gives us some insight into that story. Uh, let's skip this one because uh, of time. Um, here's another one. It trains us to understand more of what we read. For example, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. The Bible tells a story where Elijah called on fire from heaven. From archaeology, we found Baal, and we realized that one of his powers, if you look at this image, in this hand over here, he has this squiggly thing. It might look like a tree branch, but it's not a tree branch. It's a bolt of lightning. Baal is the god of the storm. His voice is the thunder. He sends the lightning and the rain to the earth. And so how do you show that Baal is really powerless? Hey, send your lightning down to the altar. And before that, let's say no rain for until the God of Israel says so. You want to show up Baal's you know, lack of power? You target what's supposedly his power. And we know how to answer that story. Why they have all the contests? Why choose the God who lights his own altar? Because... That's Baal's power, and we know that from archaeology. It was a targeted thing to discredit Baal in front of everybody and uh, show who really sends the lightning, who sends the fire from heaven, and the rain. Archaeology resurrects forgotten people. Some of us have probably heard about the Hittites. They were totally forgotten in history, preserved in the Bible, and people thought the Bible made them up until we dug them up in Turkey. 
So um, it also provides a chronology for biblical, biblical events, what came first, who came second, and it helps us put stories and events and peoples in order. Archaeology helps us sort out dates on that. It also helps us identify biblical sites. Sometimes we have a, a mound of ruins, we have no name. What site was this? But sometimes the Bible gives us clues on the geography or the location or an event that this shows evidence of, and it helps us know what site that is. And so uh, that's happened several times. It also can demonstrate the Bible's accuracy. And you know, we've, we can do that many, many times over. The Bible says this, and archaeology shows, yeah, that's actually the way it was. And that makes the Bible not only, you know, able, we can put more faith in the Bible, can I say it makes the Bible more teachable? We can teach skeptics more easily if we can demonstrate the things that cause them to doubt. People, or our culture all the time hears about how untrustworthy and made up and fictitious the Bible is. When we can demonstrate the opposite, it helps us teach better. It's a teaching tool, and it can be powerful if used correctly and, not, uh, and uh, avoiding some of those pitfalls that actually can work against us. I talked about earlier. Archaeology can provide parables to illustrate biblical teachings. New parables. And uh, in fact, here's an example. Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 7 of building your house on the rock versus building it on the sand. You know, the rains come and everything and the house on the sand collapses. The house on the rock stands. Go to Caesarea. Herod the Great built an ar a harbor completely fake. Well, not fake. It was real. Artificial harbor. This section of the coastline is flat, but he wanted to turn it into a usable port. And you have to have a place where your ships can park and be safe from the waves and the weather. So he used waterproof cement that the Romans had invented. And with waterproof cement, built a huge um, port, breakwater, with an entrance and ships could sail in there. This breakwater would absorb the energy of the waves and the wind and the ships could park there and you have a functional port. And it worked great. Paul used it a few times. The problem is that it was built on the seabed, which is sand. And so the waves come and the winds blow and the whole thing collapses under the ocean. See, now we have a sermon. We have a, new, we have a parable from archaeology that illustrates Jesus' teaching. Jesus used things around them. He used the land and buildings and things around people. We can, archaeology shows us some of those things and we can use them as illustrations as well. Here's the final one. Archaeology brings us closer to the original understanding of the people who wrote the Bible and read the Bible for the first time. You see, we're separated by thousands of years and we're on the other side of the world. We read the Bible. It's already translated away from the original languages, so you miss some things there. But aren't we philosophically originalists, restorationists? We seek the original pattern the original ways, the original gospel, the original church, what did it believe and practice and do? We're originalists. Archaeology brings us closer to the original people. We can see things through their eyes. We can see the context of their lives. And it helps us understand the scriptures and the perspectives in the scriptures more accurately. It's a perfect tool for people like us, originalists, restoring the original ways. It helps us bridge those huge gaps of space and time. And um, it helps us in the way we look at the Bible and teach the Bible. Finally, last thing here, we'll have a couple minutes for questions perhaps. Opportunities for you who are here and you who are watching this on YouTube as well, on the live stream. Uh, uh, this is a student from this past year. She was here last year at, at Florida College and this past semester, Madison Turner. Maybe some of you know her. She went with me last year to Israel, along with a number of other people, to excavate. And uh, there she is excavating at a site which uh, some think might be Ziklag, a city associated with David. I'm pretty sure it's not, but it's still a site related to David's time and maybe to the history of Israel in the time of David. It, has, uh, it looks like it in other ways. It's just not in the right place. Ziklag's supposed to be further south. This is up too far. But other than that, very biblical place. It was Philistine, then it became Judah. So it changed hands. It shows powers, you know, the Philistines fading away, at least in this area, and someone replacing them, which is the time of David. And the things date to David's time. She went, and there she is uh, with some pottery she's just discovering there. 
uh, Canaanite pottery from before the Philistines, actually. See, the Philistines kicked out the Canaanites first. You see? We can get things from archaeology that give us a bit of pic bigger picture of the history. Madison's not the only FC student who's been there. We've had several students over the years go on digs and several faculty as well. Dr. McClister has been on the excavation uh, once with me and his daughter Michelle. And uh, in fact, Dr. McClister was the first person to find architecture uh, at the city of Lachish or Lachish in its first season that we were there. So bravo, Dr. McClister and his team. But uh, it's a wonderful opportunity and it brings you closer to the Bible. And uh, going on a dig, it's something anyone can do. It puts you in the Bible, literally. And you're there reshaping a little part of the land with your fingers and your trowel like people did thousands of years ago. And what you do in your spot where you're working will shape that part of the land forever. You become a part of that land's history just like David or Gideon or Mary or anyone else who did anything in that land. You become a part of it too. And that touches the heart. And the mind as well. Um, from an academic perspective, interdisciplinary, what kind of majors benefit from a dig experience? And we think, you know, history, archaeology, anthropology. I want to tell you, I've dug with musicians, artists, dancers, accountants, um, scientists, nurses, students of all these things, um, biblical studies people, historians, um, and more. And all of these found benefit from this. First of all, it looks great on a transcript or a, a, a CV or a, a resume. I was here at, you know, at digging at a, a historical site and finding artifacts for people to analyze. But you also have geographers and scientists and uh, different types of scientists and historians and anthropologists and uh, paleontologists or zoologists. Many different types of specialties intersect in understanding these things. Botanists, um, you know, there are different questions. Some people study the music or the music or the literature and you're getting into different kinds of liberal arts fields there. If you're looking for interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary things, liberal studies kinds of things, this is a perfect partner for that approach. If you're a liberal studies major, this is a perfect experience for you and you can do it for credit. Florida College may begin offering something like this for credit in, you know, in a few years. You can also get credit through universities there. And that looks great in your transcript. It can count towards your degree. You transfer it in. Uh, it's, it's great. It improves your reading and understanding of the Bible. You notice things more carefully. You notice details you missed before. And with that, if you teach it on any level, it improves your teaching as well. And it's just a unique experience that shapes you, your own character, your career, Many different options on that, and it can shape your life, potentially. The benefits stay with you for years to come. That's my presentation. Uh, we're just about out of time, but maybe we, have, uh, we can take a couple of questions. Does anyone have a question you'd like to ask that we can answer in you know, the next couple, three minutes? A lot of information. Yes. How do you deal with bad weather at an active site? Good question. Um, if it's raining, you really can't go out and dig because you're churning things up in the mud. It mixes things. You can't see the levels, and it's sloppy. Um, people in the Mediterranean world, including Israel, Palestine, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Greece, the whole thing, dig in the summertime, typically, because the summertime is the dry season. Uh, in Israel, for example, I've, I've spent most of, I've spent eight and a half months in Israel of my life, and about seven and a half of that had been in the summer. I've never seen one rainstorm, not one. The rain comes in the winter this time of year. You don't dig in the winter. But in the summer, it's dry and clear, and it's perfect digging weather. Someone else? Yes. question is, like carbon-14, its usefulness, its accuracy or lack thereof in getting age, you know, how far back does it go, you know, um, thousands of years, tens or you know, much more with the whole age of the earth. Don't have time or really the expertise to really get into details of that. I will say this, um, 
Carbon-14 has an inherent plus or minus. The further back in time you go, the bigger it tends to be. In recent years, they've also discovered that some time periods will give false readings. They don't know exactly why, but they've discovered in certain time periods, the carbon-14 is not nearly as reliable as it is in other times, just randomly, it you know, almost seems like. Now, there's a reason for it, of course. But, for example, the time of David, you carbon date something, you have to put a plus or minus 80 years in there, or 100 years. So really, it doesn't, it's not as accurate as you would think, and... Um, the further back you go, the less accurate it is. And um, really, with carbon-14, for example, you have to go on assumptions. You have to know exactly how much the carbon-14 was there to begin with. You have to trust the rate of decay from carbon-14 to carbon-12 has remained the same throughout history. And you have to trust that none of it's leaked in or out. And um, how do you verify all those things? You really can't. You have to, some faith and assumptions. And so it's a limited use. Carbon-14 is a tool but you have to use it in conjunction with other ones, and its, limit, its usefulness recedes and fades the further back you go. That's a, that's a short answer for the time periods we're looking at in the Bible. It's one tool, but it's not the final answer on anything. It has a variance in it. One more question, maybe, and then we'll have to call it. Yes? What happens to all the artifacts when you're done? And um, what you suggested, they do store them. Uh, the archaeologist has to get a permit from the government, and after and that permit covers um, controlling the artifacts and managing them while they're being researched. Once you're finished with them, they do store them. And uh, countries have facilities for that. Israel, for example, has a really big climate-controlled warehouse uh, just a few miles north of Kirbet Kayafa, that site with David I was talking about. And they have literally every artifact that's ever been discovered in the country in that warehouse, organized by time period and by type. And what you do, what you have, it's a, it's a library. When you find a pot or a weapon or a tool, you can go to that warehouse and compare it with others there and look at what people were able to conclude about those, and then it tells you about the one you have. And so it's a central resource that's a great research tool. It protects them from looters and uh, vandals because there's a lot of that. And there's a lot of theft as well. But um, the mo when it's done right, uh, if it's exceptional, it goes to a museum. If, if it's not exceptional, it goes to a warehouse and people who need it to study can access it later. So, okay, well, if you have any other questions that come to you, I'll be around for a few minutes. You can also connect with me. My email is lukechandler at verizon.net. I did not put it up here, though I should have. Email me if you want, though, if you have any questions, follow-ups. If you're interested in going on a dig with me sometime, or going to the I Lead Tours without doing digs as well, but um, I'm looking at possibly doing a dig in 2021. Uh, if not, then 2022. Probably we'll see. But if you're interested in something like that, contact me, lukechandler at verizon.net, and I can give you some details, and you have time to plan and see if that's something for you. I will say, it's uh, I've dug with people from as young as 11 years old all the way up to people in their late 70s and everything in between. You find all, all types of people on a dig and the benefits are tremendous. It's not just for archaeologists. It's for anyone who uh, believes they're healthy enough to go and do that for a couple of weeks. Well, thank you all so much. You've been very gracious and I look forward to hearing back from any questions you may have. Have a good night. Stay healthy. And... Uh, Thanks again for coming out.